have spent more time flying around on the backs of dragons in this game than I really care to admit. And in today's video, I'm gonna be showing you every single thing you need to know about farming dragon parts in Tears of the Kingdom. Farming up dragon parts in Tears of the Kingdom has completely changed from the way it was in Breath of the Wild. In many ways, it's a lot easier, but it's also more time consuming because they can no longer be forcibly spawned like in Breath of the Wild. But with all the information I'm providing in today's video, you'll be able to farm up all the dragon parts your heart could ever desire. The first thing you need to know is that all dragons exist at the map at all times. They're either above ground flying around or below ground in the depths also flying around. If you know where to look, you can find a dragon at any point in time you want. And I will be providing maps for their exact routes so that way you can follow them wherever you need to go. First, let's cover Farosh. Thankfully, you won't really need any electrical resistance armor unless you get hit by one of those balls, which you really shouldn't if you're paying attention. Now, Farosh can be found towards the southwest corner of the map and the easiest towers to get to him from are from the Gerudo Canyon Skyview Tower, the Gerudo Highlands Skyview Tower, or the Poplar Foothill Skyview Tower just before they enter this chasm. Now the path Farash will take is as follows. Farash will exit this chasm right here and then follow this path along going right next to the Skyview Tower and then coming around this bend and then going over Lake Hylia and then once again entering this chasm right here. From here Farash will enter the depths and then you can follow this path along the depths around Lake Hylia which is just going to be a giant wall in the depths and it's going to make its way around here, around another wall, where it will exit the chasm and continue its path above ground. This is a continuous loop that the dragon will be following at all times, and it will always be found along this route no matter what. Sleeping or trying to skip time in any way will not make the dragon move to a new position. They will maintain their path no matter what you try and do. Most places you stand on Farosh while you're above the ground, you shouldn't have any problem avoiding all of these electric balls. Now that being said, you are going to be high up in the air and you're going to be flying over these snowy regions, so you might need at least one piece of cold weather armor to not take any damage while you're on top of the dragon. Now just like all dragons, you can hit the horn for a horn, and you'll notice that the spikes on the back of the dragon now are no longer lit. This means you cannot harvest anything else from the dragon for 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes you have a choice of either getting a horn, a scale, or a claw. You also have all of these Farosh spikes that go along the dragon's back. You can fuse these to weapons or use them as arrows. They do have a very wide impact radius, so if you're going to use them, make sure you're far away from whatever you're shooting, or you're probably going to drop all your weapons and have a really bad time. There's a total of 12 of these shards along the dragon's back, and this goes for all of the dragons in Tears of the Kingdom. So just kind of make your way along the dragon's back and collect all of these. You usually can collect them about midway. There's nothing down near the tail or anything like that. But make sure as you're running back to keep an eye on the back of these little shards because there might be more of these little spikes just behind the shards that you might have missed while you're traveling down the dragon's back and harvesting. Next, we're going to cover Nadra, the Frost Dragon. This is probably my favorite dragon and my favorite dragon parts to collect. Nadra can be found southeast from central Hyrule and one of the best places to mount it is going to be at the Mount Lenaru Skyview Tower while it exits this chasm right here. You can also mount it from the Rubella Wetlands Skyview Tower as well as the <laughs> slope Skyview Tower. The path Nadra is going to take is exiting out of the chasm at Mount Lenario, and then following this path just along here, kind of going towards this bay, then going across to East Nakluda, and then heading all the way up to Kariko Village, where it will then enter the chasm here. Once it enters the chasm, it's going to go into the depths and follow this path kind of along this river, which is going to be a giant wall here, and then making its way back down to the chasm where it's going to exit. This is the continuous loop. This is where it's going to be above ground, and then it's going to go underground right along here. Now, you will need one piece of cold weather gear to be able to just hang out on this dragon without ever taking any damage at all, due to the fact that it is flying around these snowy regions and it does have these little white ice balls that come flying out of its face but as long as you're paying attention they won't really hit you and the only time you're really at risk of getting hit from them is when they're going in and out of the chasm or if you're hanging out right on the face otherwise this dragon is exactly the same you can get a horn a claw or all of the shards along its back and just like the other dragon and all the other dragons all of these resources respawn every 10 minutes now while you can farm up all of the other dragons without really actually needing armor to help you with it it, Dinroll is a whole different story. You can't go near this bad Mamba Jamba without having at least a level two flame guard. You can get this by using the flame breaker armor. You can use two pieces of this or one piece. And if you got the Varudanya divine helm from an amiibo or from a chest, you can use that as well. Dinroll's pathing is a little bit weirder than the other dragons. You can go to the Ulri Mountain Skyview Tower and hitch a ride as they exit this chasm right here. Or you can go to the Typhlo Ruin Skyview Tower and jump on before entering this chasm here. 
Otherwise, you're going to need some stamina to glide your way over to their pathing point as they go along this area here. Dinroll will exit the chasm around the Akala Highlands and then follow this path right along here above ground making its way past the Elden Mountains and then entering the chasm just right here. Once underground, Dendril's going to turn around and follow this pathway right along back, going down below this area here, back up, and then making its way down and then out through this chasm right here. This is the continuous loop. The bright red is going to be above ground and the dark red is going to be below ground. Now for Dinral, you really only need to have the armor if you do want to farm up its back for the Dinral spikes, or if you want to be able to sit on the dragon's back to be able to farm up horns and scales without actually getting off. Otherwise, you can keep your distance and just shoot it from afar and then collect the item that you want from the ground. Farming dragon horns is easier than ever. All you need to do is just sit on the dragon and you can slap it and you can literally pick up the horn without having to drop down, which means maybe you're at work and you want to farm up dragon parts. All you need to do is just sit on their back and about every 10 minutes you slap it again for another piece. You can also visually see when the dragon is ready to be harvested again. You'll notice that after we hit the dragon to collect that horn, both the horns and the spikes on the dragon's back no longer light up anymore. You'll know that the dragon is ready to be harvested again once these spikes and horns light back up. And just like that, you really cannot miss when the dragon's ready to be harvested again. Now, you don't have to just farm up horns this way. Maybe you want scales. All you gotta do is just slap the body and the scale appears right in front of your face. Now, the only hard part to actually be able to harvest are the claws because you're gonna have to get down on their feet and most likely you're not going to be able to slap it, grab the claw and get back onto the body at the same time. But I'm sure some of you out there can probably do it. Now, if you are wanting to farm up claws, I would say doing it while the dragon is in the depths is probably the easiest way to be able to do it because even though you might end up falling in the gloom, at the very least, it's really easy to be able to get back up onto the dragon because what we can do is just use auto build, build our favorite traveling device, which is just this little hover glider thing and then just fly right back up on top of it. Now, like I mentioned, the dragons do exist both above and below ground in the depths, and they continuously go through this loop, which means if you do want to be farming the dragon's backs, you can actually maintain being on their back. But I do recommend while the dragon is diving down into the depths that you get a little bit higher up on their back or else their effects will hit you if you're a little bit closer because they kind of spawn out of the dragon's head. And if you're closer to the head when you're diving down, you're going to get hit by those constantly. So just move up the back a little bit, hang on and don't move, and you won't actually use any stamina and you can actually ride these dragons all the way through the depths as well. Now once the dragon levels out you can move back up to your safety spot right behind the first horn and this is also a great vantage point to maybe find some light roots you haven't discovered in the depths. This also means that if you're trying to harvest certain dragons and you know what their path is you can actually find them in the depths and you can get to them on Zonai devices or rockets or really whatever you need to do so anytime you need to farm dragon parts they always are existing on the map. You just need to know where to find them. They're also also really easy to see in the depths because they light up the entire darkness especially if their spikes are glowing so it really makes it easy to find them in the depths if so if you can't find the dragon you're looking for out in the world just go down to the depths where we've already marked their route and then just use something like this zonai device to be able to fly up to it because they move really slow you can catch up pretty easily and then just hop on its back Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Now things get a little bit more sketchy when we're exiting the depths. You want to move a little bit farther on the back than you were when you were going down because their effects do travel a little bit closer to their back. But I'm finding that by the third or fourth spike, I seem to be pretty safe just to hang on and kind of ride the dragon out of the chasm. But you notice just like that, that I did get hit by that frozen one. And it's a little bit of a bummer when that happens. If you do get hit, just make sure to keep smashing the glide button. But if you hang out down towards the very bottom of the back, you'll never really get hit by any of these effects. So what you can do is while they're actually going up through the chasm, you can just use your glider to kind of fall down their back a little bit and then just hang on towards the tail. And you should be perfectly fine to just be able to do it this way. The closer you are to the head, the more problems you're going to have. And just like before, make sure to not move so that way you're not using any stamina. As long as you don't move, you can hang on for the entire ride. And then the second they start leveling out, all you got to do is just hop up and you can start moving along their back again. Now, last but certainly not least, 
the Dragon of Light. This dragon is by far the most difficult to locate on the map because of its large flight pattern, but once you know what to do, you can make it so much easier. There's two reasons that the Light Dragon is so difficult to find, the first of which being that it typically flies significantly higher than every other dragon. And by that, I mean it actually flies at the maximum height that the game will allow you to do for the majority of its path. But there's actually a trick that we can do to get it to permanently fly significantly lower. Just as low, in fact, as all the other dragons, making it significantly easier to find. The other thing that makes it difficult even when it's flying lower is that it has one giant continuous loop that it travels through over the course of two hours. But there are a couple tricks that we can use to make this significantly easier to locate. Now, just like the other dragons, there are 12 shards along its back. You can get a horn, a scale, and a claw from it, and it does respawn every 10 minutes, just like the other dragons. Now, let's get into what you need to do to actually make the light dragon permanently fly lower than it otherwise would. Now, to do this, we're going to need to enter the depths. If you launch out of the Typhlo Ruins Skyview Tower and then head your way south, you actually want to enter this chasm point right here just southeast of Korok Forest. Just dive right down into this nice little hole. And while you're falling, don't forget that you can shoot some light blooms to light up your path below you so that way you can at least see what you're getting into. Once down here, I definitely recommend making the green goblin glider and you can attach a bright bloom seed to it. If you shoot the seed, you're going to have a free light on the end of it. And then we're just going to hop on this bad boy. Now what we can do is actually open up our main map and we can see exactly where we need to go. You can use this as a guide. We gotta follow this road along and we just need to end up here at the Korok Forest. If we follow this bend around, we can already see where we need to go lit up by a bright bloom seed ahead of us. We actually just need to make it to this tower that's right in front of us. So getting to this little tower with your green goblin glider is going to be incredibly easy and it makes this really just not a headache at all. Once you get to this tower, just walk to the middle and then you're going to use ascend to get all up inside of it. Once you pop outside, you're going to be inside of Korok Forest. Quite a bit different than the way you got here in Breath of the Wild. You're going to see that the Great Deku Tree is, in fact, not looking so well. And it is our job to cure the Great Deku Tree. You can grab the shrine right here just in case you want to come back here. Then from here, what we need to do is actually head up inside of the Deku Tree. Ignore all the Koroks, we're just going to make our way down to the back here. And you're going to notice that there's a big hole that we can fall down. Now we need to prepare for a battle. I'm going to show you a few tricks to make this super easy. If you happen to have the gloom armor, I definitely recommend equipping it, but by no means is it necessary at all. You're going to want to make sure that you have dazzle fruit ready. This is going to make the fight ahead extremely easy. Once you're ready, just drop down the hole. And then once you hit the bottom, gloom hands are going to spawn. This is where the dazzle fruit is going to come in handy. Once they fully spawn, shoot that dazzle fruit. It's going to completely stun them. Then you could grab some bomb flowers and just shoot it towards the middle of them, which is going to light them all on fire. And you can just repeat this process. Just use dazzle fruits and bombs to be able to completely stun them and then use bombs to kill them. You need to kill all of these hands at the same time or they're going to continuously respawn. Once the hands are dead, you get to fight Phantom Ganon which is going to cause all sorts of bad stuff to happen around you, and it can be a little bit of a difficult fight, but just blast them to death if you can, make sure to try and block his attacks, or you could just take it to the face like me, because apparently I'm terrible at the game. I definitely recommend using a little bit more strategy than I did. I decided to face tank it, probably not the right choice. Once you defeat Phantom Ganon in the worst or best way possible, the Deku Tree is going to be healed. You're going to be greeted by some Koroks that say the Great Deku Tree is waiting for us in Korok Forest. Don't forget to pick up the resources. You get some nice dark clumps. You can get the Demon King's Bow, which gets more powerful the more hearts you have unlocked. And you can also get the Gloom Sword, which there's a fun trick we can do with this. Fast travel back to the shrine that we unlocked and then climb up the Great Deku Tree. If you go right here, you can actually talk to it. And if you haven't unlocked the Master Sword yet, it's going to pin on your map the location that you need to go to to get onto the Light Dragon. But as an added bonus for healing the Deku Tree, this Light Dragon will now be permanently flying half as high as it used to before, making it significantly easier to be able to find and mount the dragon. Unfortunately, if you have pulled the Master Sword, the Great Deku Tree will no longer pin where 
where the light dragon is on your map, so it's up to us to be able to find it. You can see this in action already. The light dragon is currently flying around Death Mountain way lower than it was before. If you do not heal the Great Deku Tree, the light dragon will be so freaking high it's almost impossible to see just due to the switch's rendering problems. So doing this will drastically increase your ability to be able to find the light dragon whenever you want. Now that you have the light dragon's path lowered, this is going to be the path that they follow at all times over the course of two hours. The light dragon will always follow this path in a clockwise manner. And what's great is you can see that the light dragon passes by every single tower. So what you can do is you can travel to all of these towers to see if the light dragon is anywhere nearby. This makes it a lot easier once you know the path. Now that we know the light dragon always travels clockwise, we can use a little bit of a trick. What we want to do is we want to check all of these towers in a counterclockwise manner. That way, no matter what we do, we will run into this dragon without missing it. So what you're going to do is launch out of one of these towers, hit your glider, and then look around. The light dragon, when it's near a tower, should be at a lower height than that particular tower, just like all the other dragons, as long as you save the Great Deku Tree. If you did not save the Great Deku Tree, that dragon's going to be way the hell up there and you're never going to see it. You might see it, but it's really, really hard. But essentially, all you need to do is travel across all of these towers along its path in a counterclockwise manner, and you will be able to find this dragon very, very easily. Now, one of the best uses for these light dragon items is to actually use it to fuse onto the Hylian shield. If you do this, you can use this shield as a permanent healing item, which is pretty freaking amazing, especially if you're bad at the game like I am. What's really interesting about this is we can parry into an object, and no matter what, we're going to gain back a quarter of a heart whether we hit the thing or not so you can use this to actually parry into a shield and you can regenerate your hearts this way while blocking i think it's a pretty great addition to your shield and if you're new to the game it could come in really handy for regenerating some of your early hearts well, ladies and gentlemen, that is everything you need to know about dragons in Tears of the Kingdom. I really do hope it helped everybody out. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you all in the next one.